Good morning and welcome to our live talk program. This is Lloyd Grubb here, your host on Revive Reform Radio, doing our live talk program covering motivation on this year, Monday morning, rise and shine and give God the glory. And this morning here, we're looking at a topic, say to the righteous, it shall be well with him. Say to the righteous, it shall be well with him. So welcome again, hopefully the blessed night rest and you're ready to take on this week, this work week as we begin this work week. Let us pray. Our Father, who art in heaven, I thank you again for the blessings of this day, for the blessings of life, for the blessings, dear Lord, of being able to um, come here and communicate to those that you love. May you bless us, dear Lord, as we um, look into these things, and may our grace go with us, dear Lord, for Christ's sake. Amen. So I'm looking at this topic. Say to the righteous, it shall be well with him. So say to the righteous, it shall be well with him. And this is found in Isaiah chapter 3. And I'll read it in a little bit here. Isaiah 3 verse 10. Um, and so this is something that um, is on my mind from last week. I've been thinking about this thing here as I see so many things happening. And this general theme, this concept. And uh, what I want you to imagine here is the church. Imagine the church has figured out. You don't have to really imagine it, but the church has figured out how to, how to or a way to tell the unrighteous it shall be well with him. So the church has figured out to, through what we call prosperity gospel, new theology, to tell the unrighteous that it shall be well with him. While the Bible says... Um, if you're unrighteous, it shall not be well with you. And somehow they have made the gospel of Christ um, by, you know, made the gospel of Christ this thing that tells the unrighteous it shall be well with him. Somehow they have circumnavigated the Bible and to communicate to the people that no matter how you live, God's grace is going to cover. And this has caused so much problems in the world, in the church, because one can still be a Christian and can have the benediction over you, the proclamation over you. They can claim righteousness for you. They can claim morality. So I want to talk about this with you here. What happened? What is going on when a church claim righteousness for somebody? Yet the Bible says, say to the righteous, it shall be well with him. It's that person shall be well. This is totally logical. And every time I think about this, I think about the dark ages, how the church then tried to sanctify unrighteousness and say to the people it was going to be well with them. And all that happened was bubonic plague, wars, pestilence, destruction. And they just kept on burying people because they kept on telling the people, it's going to be all right with you. You just have to just accept God's grace. In Psalms 1, verse 1 through 6, this most powerful and beautiful Psalms, Psalms 1, Psalm 1, verse 1 through 6, it said, Blessed is the man that walketh not, in the counsel of the ungodly, nor standeth in the way of sinners, nor sitteth in the seat of the scornful. So when you think about that, the Bible said, this man here is blessed. Now imagine if the devil could figure out a way to make the church say that the man who walk in the counsel of the ungodly, the man that um, stand in the way of sinners, and the man that sitteth in the seat of the scornful is blessed. Imagine if the church did this. And to me, that's what... What do they call it? New theology, the gospel of grace, grace oriented message, um, whatever, prosperity gospel. All of these things that they come up with is simply, in my understanding, it's a methodology of telling somebody that is not going to be blessed. It's not this man being described in Psalms 1, that he is blessed and that he can sit there in the seat of the scornful and the scorn is basically he's sick in the stomach of the scornful person and he's going to be blessed. While the Bible says the righteous man is the person who avoid those people. Notice it says here, but his delight is in the law of the Lord and in his law that he meditate day and night. And he shall be like a tree planted by the rivers of water that bringeth forth his fruit in his season. His leaf also shall not wither and whatsoever he doeth shall prosper. Now notice here, this is the righteous man. Say to this man, it shall be well with him. But to the person who is not living this way, it shall not be well with him. This is what the Bible requires of the preacher to preach. Notice here in verse 4, The ungodly are not so, and are like a chaff, are like a chaff which 
the wind drive it away. Therefore the ungodly shall not stand in judgment, nor sinners in the congregation of the righteous. For the Lord knoweth the way of the righteous, but the way of the ungodly shall perish. The way of the ungodly shall perish. Now somebody say, but can't grace save that ungodly person? Sure, the person can be saved in the kingdom. But up until that point, it, will not, it shall not be well with him. I think one of the best examples of this idea of say to the righteous, it shall be well with him. But to the wicked, it shall not be well. Is a thief on the cross. Think about the thief on the cross. It was not well for him. Now, was he promised salvation? Do we believe that he's saved? Yes. But was it well with him? No. Even after he was promised salvation, Christ says, Today I'm giving you the promise that you shall be with me in paradise. I certify that I'm going to save you right now from my lips. The thief of the cross, the one that was, you know, begged, asked for forgiveness. Think about that. Christ forgave them, so to speak, because he had acknowledged his sin. He says that we deserve what we're getting. But when Christ forgave him, that didn't spare him from the death penalty. The death penalty was not spared him. Christ did not spare him for the death penalty. Christ didn't say to the Romans, don't kill him because I forgive him and save him in my kingdom. Christ says, I'm going to save you. And then that was the end of the conversation. And now it's going to be well with him in eternity, for eternity, when the resurrection happened. But after Christ promised him salvation, it was not well with him. He suffered for the, for the crimes that he did. It will not be well with the unrighteous. But the righteous man shall be well. Now somebody said, but it wasn't well with Christ because he suffered also. But he suffered an innocent man. See, nobody think that he deserved what he got. But the thief on the cross, he got what was coming to him. And Christ did not save him from that penalty. The death penalty was still um, executed upon his head. So that's the reality of life. It's, it's the issue here, not so much a, just about salvation but it's also about the life that we live but imagine if a church come along now some preachers come along and say wait 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 it was well for the thief on the cross it was good all those nails he was getting and all the beatings he got he, he was good for him. and it would be good for you because that's the message that we're sending your way they'll be saying that says no matter what you live no matter how you live it's all right god's gonna save you because his grace is powerful and life now start going a wire for you you can't understand why. Why is life can't, you know, why am I so much turmoil? Not realizing that you're reaping the result of your action. But if you live a life of righteousness, the Lord says through Isaiah, say to the righteous man, it will be well for you. When trouble come, it's not that you're not going to go through the storm. You're just going to be in an ark. See, no went through the storm. And everybody else that was alive when he was there, when he was alive on that time period in earth's history, they went through the storm also. But, say to Noah and those in the ark, it shall be well for them. But for those outside the ark, it shall not be well. Both went through the ark, both experienced the results of the water, but what was in the ark? And that's the difference. Notice here in Isaiah chapter 3, verse 4 through 15. Isaiah 3 verse 4 through 15. This now is where I get this concept from, this title from. Notice in verse 4 it says, And I will give children to be their princes, and babes shall rule over them. Now imagine the trouble. Now you read the story of Israel and how disastrous it was. They probably had one young king that Josiah's name by name that was a benefit and blessing to them. But for the most part, the Lord will literally allow them to just bring a child and rule over them a disaster. Notice in America in the Constitution, one of the requirements for running for the presidency of the United States is that you have to be 35 and older. Um, you can imagine after Europe, they said, no more, never again. We ain't never going to do that again. We can't have children running the show. <laughs> you know, just imagine that. The disasters that you can imagine some child who is out of control. Just think about your child and now you flip the switch. Right now, if you have a child, just imagine you decide that the children's gonna make all decisions in the house. They're gonna run the house the way they wanna run. <laughs> Sorry, they're gonna run the house the way they want to run the house. That is just phenomenal. Just imagine the excitement. And there's people living like this. 
Oh, their kids as the main voice in the house. Imagine you take some of these kids now and say, you're going to be the person that's going to run the country. Any country. You take any country and just take like a 12-year-old. You just randomly pick, do it like a lottery. Just drop on a social security number and say, that child's going to run the house, run the, house, the country. And imagine the excitement. Uh, when you tell that child, you run the country. Whatever decision you make, we follow. Because you the man. Or you the woman. And you can imagine, that would be what it is. So here, part of the punishment of Israel is that a child's going to run the country. Now, how does Isaiah, you know, I'm jumping ahead because it's in my head, all in my head, these texts. How does Isaiah, right? I don't mean these texts for this presentation, not all texts. But how does Isaiah, right? How does he, the Lord, sorry, tell Isaiah to say to the righteous, it shall be well. Now imagine you're in a country and a 12-year-old take, take over the country and run it. Somehow they have it that a child can run the country. And then Isaiah now says to the people, say, the Lord want me to tell you, that I say to the righteous, it shall be well with him. But you'd be like, what? And the righteous thinking, we, we go, it's going to be okay with us? I mean, there's a child running the country. What, what do you expect? You expect? It's going to be bad for everybody. And Isaiah said, no. The Lord says, trust me. I want you to believe in me. We have faith. It's going to be well with the righteous. But with the unrighteous, it's going to be bad. So there has to be more to the gospel than just simply proclaiming righteousness on people. There has to be a practical outlay because, you know, if, if you're doing wrong and you have a child running the country, you, you're just in a mess. Now, if you're doing right, you're going to still be in a problem. Like, with uh, you know, as I say, Noah, it was in the ark, but he was still in the rain. He just was covered by, from the rain. So, say to the righteous, it shall be well, is fascinating in itself. And this is to me why it's important for you to understand and know that out of anything I can say to motivate you, the best thing I can say is, you find Jesus and you live a life of righteousness. You shall be blessed. You shall increase. Your your orange shall increase. You shall um, receive blessings that are going to overflow in your life because you're doing the right thing and you're following the right leader. But those who are not, it's going to be worse. You see, those who are locked in the system, they're going to get beaten down because they have a child. Their, their bread and butter is, is coming from a child. It cannot be good. Child don't know what they're doing. Look at this. Notice here. And the people shall, shall be oppressed, every one by another, and every one by his neighbor. The children shall behave himself proudly against the ancient, and the base, the base against the honorable. So base would be a low life person. So a low life, you know, person on the side of the street would be screaming at somebody that is um that again that, that is um honorable. Right? But then you've seen this. You know, they, you have to protect yourself. So if you notice you're the righteous, you'll be like, hmm, how do I avoid this? Psalms chapter 1. Psalms chapter 1 says you have to learn how to navigate when this type of nonsense is in play. You got to know how to, okay, I don't go certain places. I don't deal with certain people. I avoid certain situations. Because if you don't, you know, you, you, you know they say liberty. You know, liberty comes through carelessness. That's one of the sayings I grew up with. Liberty comes through, through carelessness. So what happens in that statement? What it's basically saying, liberty is not so much freedom to do the right thing, but freedom to do wrong. Like people will basically have free access to you to basically disrespect you and treat you bad. So you have to be very careful, not careless. So you have to be very circumspect. You have to act in a measured way. Because when people get familiar with you, they tend to show their true colors. So you kind of have to sometimes keep people at the distance. Does that make sense? So say to the righteous, it shall be well. Why? Because you're forewarned. I'm telling you what's going to be the environment. Just imagine say, if a child is ruling over us. And you're there. And you're the adult. Man, you're going to have to maneuver. Because... This child, every, every, you have to be thinking ahead, like child, child, child. You have to think, okay, what does children do? Oh, children, is, you know, and you got to know how a child is crazy. You have to go back there. You know, like, okay, let's think, what, was, what would I be thinking to do when I was like 12? Okay, here goes the mess. 
and then you brace yourself. So the children is in charge. Somebody said, no, that's okay, but no parent is going to say to a child, you're in charge. Not necessarily, but if you see how many parents lead their children, you realize the child is in charge because the parent, as I say, my best example in my mind is always like a lollipop. And the parent, instead of giving the child a lollipop, I say, lick the lollipop. The parent says, tuck your tongue out, and the parent wipe the lollipop across their mouth. This is like the level of how some of your parents are weak. You know, it's a weak leadership. And so the child is really in charge. Notice here, um, it says, uh, so it, it's, I'll read verse 6. It says, when a man shall take hold of his brother of his house, of the house of his father, saying, thou as clothing be thou our ruler and let this reign be on be under thy hand so basically anything goes it was, you know like i said children ruling them they just grab somebody and say you be the ruler it's ain't no no value to the rulership you know you think about it you would never take a five five uh, sorry you never take a fortune 500 company and um just make anybody run it you run it in the ground. I wouldn't be able to run it. You know, I just, you know, you wouldn't do it. You wouldn't just give me, because your system and stuff in place that I really don't understand how to run that larger for a system. But you could take somebody and say, I want to run it. And with no qualification, they're not going to be able to run it. The business of the day-to-day -day operation is not going to be carried out. person going to be a figurehead. person going to be sitting there in the seat, but they don't know what they're doing. And it would be the same thing like having a child running a country or having, um, you know, anything else run a country. You could have just put a chimp in the position at that point. Now, in that day shall he swear, saying, I will not be a healer, for in my house is neither bread nor clothing. Make me not a ruler of the people. For Jerusalem is ruined and Judah is fallen because their tongue and their doings are against the Lord to provoke the eyes of glory. Show the show of their countenance that witness against them and they declare their sin as Sodom. They hide it not. Woe unto their soul for they have reward evil unto themselves. Notice here, it says they are reward evil unto themselves. They're doing it to themselves. Ain't nobody doing it to them. They're doing it to themselves. And they're proud about it. Because remember, the sin of Sodom is pride. One of the main sin of Sodom. It's not what they're doing per se, per se is the problem. It's their pridefulness about it. And so, notice it says their sin as Sodom, they hide it not. They're like, hey, look at me. And is you know, and it says that it shall be well with him, for they shall eat the fruit. Sorry, not that I jumped down here. So they declare their sin because their tongues and their doings, they show of their countenance that witness against them. And notice it says, for um, for they have reward evil unto themselves. So it is them that's beating up themselves. For the most part. I know God steps in at a certain point and just start walking people. But a lot of the problems that are happening, it's because of their doing. So that's why this topic is so important. Say to the righteous, or this phrase is important, at least in my mind. And I want to show you the emphasis of it. Say to the righteous, it shall be well with him. Because he's receiving from his action. But for the wicked, it shall not be well because the wicked is receiving from their action. So I'm here this morning to tell you, say, I'm saying to you that it shall be well with you because you're going to receive the result of your action. And that's fair. I've thought about it so much and say, well, God is merciful. God is a kind God, right? But yet, God is fair and just. And oh God, although God is so merciful and graceful, God, as I said, still made a thief on the cross get the result of his actions. Although through his mercy he shall save him. And that's the problem with, you know, the concept of the New Testament. This is what they try to trick up the people. They, they've tricked the people. The, most of Christians believe that, you know, you're just going to be blessed doing wrong things. 
That's what most of Christians have to believe. Grace gonna cover it why people are just getting massacred and mashed up. And you think about it, that's the mainline teaching of Christianity, especially in the United States, which is the dominant Christian force in the world. And they have sold people on this idea globally that you can do wrong and God's grace is going to cover it. But yet the results in people's personal life is that when you do wrong, the results come back and it comes back hard. And that's it. And it is fascinating that I would have to be sitting there trying to teach the opposite. And I know most of Christianity will hear me and think what I'm saying is, is basically evil. Because I'm going against grace and all they want to hear about is grace. But yet the Bible says, Say to the righteous, it shall be well with him. So let's read it. It's, it's here now found in verse 10. Hopefully I'll kind of set that up, set that up properly. So in verse 10, notice it says, Say ye to the righteous, that it shall be well with him, for they shall eat the fruit of their doings. But notice here in verse 11, Woe unto the wicked, it shall be ill with him, for the reward of his hand shall be given him. So the reward of his hand. So the righteous do the right thing because they love Jesus. The unrighteous do the wrong thing because they hate Jesus. One get a blessing and one get a curse. There will be the story of Noah and the ark. Say to the righteous Noah to get into the ark. If you believe me, you're going to get into the ark. Say to the unrighteous, get in the ark. If you believe and you hear my warning, get into the ark. Now, when the rainstorm come, both sides are going to get their reward. They're going to get their reward for their actions. That's just the reality. And both sides did. Now, did, did the Bible says in um, Genesis chapter 6 that Noah found grace? Yes. So because of grace that Noah found in God's eye, Noah went into the ark. That's it. That's so simple what grace is. So somebody said, but can't I just receive grace and not do the right thing? Yeah, you can receive grace and not do the right thing. But one has to be careful because you can still deal with some repercussions. In other words, you could get one year in prison instead of five years in prison. And somebody say, but the person went to prison. Yeah, but they got grace. They got less punishment. Instead of losing $100,000 because you make dumb decisions, you lose $10,000. And somebody say, hey, but he lost $10,000. Yeah, but he got grace. Grace doesn't mean that you always escape the penalty or the the, 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 the destruction that was coming your way. Sometimes, as, as the Bible show all the time, multiple times, like, look at sort of Samson. Samson found grace and forgiveness and, you know, generosity from God. But he lost his eye and he died in the rubble. He died in the, in the, in the destruction. But Samson found grace. See, but there's some results for that whoring, going with whores. So again, Lord, the Lord will save a lot of people who went with prostitutes and got STDs. There's a lot of people like that will be in the kingdom, but they certainly still die of the STD and still reap the bad results of their action. So that grace does not eliminate some of the penalties and sometimes all the penalties that come with bad action. Grace just simply means that the Lord is working to save you even from your dumb decisions, from my dumb decisions. And that's what grace is. But we will suffer some penalty. So when, we, so for me, the Bible says simply, Say to the righteous, it shall be well with him, for he shall eat the fruit of his doing. But it says, Woe to the wicked, for he shall not be well with him, for he shall reward, he sh for the reward of his hand shall be given him. I've thought a lot about this long and hard. And the reason I've thought about it is long in the horn because I know there's grace, but you want to almost approach God as if he's a magician or something. And the problem with doing wrong is that if you never suffer the penalty, you wouldn't take God serious. You would take the word of God serious. And it would be like you could use grace like abuse it, which is basically what most people do. And they say, well, since God is graceful, I'm going to play the fool over here. And then when it's right time, I'm just going to ask, hey, God, forgive me. And I drop dead. 
That's what most people plan. Most people joking on there. That's what their plan is. The plan is not say, today when I hear the voice of God, I don't answer. I wait and kind of enjoy sinful a bit longer. And then I play the fool. But what it is is that, then that would be like cheating. I say, God don't promote cheating. So over the years, if you look at the Bible, when we do wrong, there's a punishment that comes. But we don't really like to talk about this. But that's just what it is. That doesn't mean that God can't be merciful to us and soften the blow. But God will make us see that sin is real. Because if we never receive it as Christians, you know, say we're Christians and we make a wrong choice or we suffer from ignorance. If we never really see certain punishment, then we never really get the opportunity to readjust. To change, shake up, you know, shake up our ways, to change our ways, to do things differently. So God still make us go through stuff. Go through tribulation and trial. But if you have a preacher telling us that, say, oh, you're going to be well with you. Just keep doing it wrong. Grace covers. Then we never really get to learn and grow. I never really see the effect of sin. So you think about Paul, right? Somebody said, well, Paul was shown grace. Yes, he was. You see, Paul is the best example because Paul is the one that they pervert the most. You know, somehow, it's harder to mess up, it seems, the writing of some of the other apostles. But Paul's writings seem to be the most perverted. Most people are sick in there. You know, I've ever dealt with that with sick people, call themselves theologians and pastors. They seem to love Ephesians especially. Somewhat Galatians, but Ephesians. And I might say this to you. Just think about this now, right? When you go into Paul's writing and you start reading about grace, you have to remember who is writing. And that's the way over the years I've learned to not be side, to not be like overcome by these modern theologians, these people that went to seminary after their PhD from the same source, which is the devil. Um, not all of them, but most of them. Uh, and 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 reason how, this is why I say think about Paul. What I'm saying here is very significant. If it's, if somebody came to me and said, "What was something profound you want to teach people?" Well, especially if you listen to certain preachers, one of the way to not be messed up by them is you have to think about the person who's writing. Paul. Not 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 listen to the theologian twist what he's saying, but think about who's writing Paul. Now, did Paul find grace in God's sight? Yeah. Was Paul damaged from the the um when he had was on the road to Damascus and the light that came to him? And the Lord says, Paul, while while prick is, while kick it kick us against the pricks. And it says for the rest of his life he was buffered. And some people believe that he was his his eyesight was damaged. Right? So you have to think about who Paul is. You have to think about when Paul say grace, what was Paul experienced? Think about the life of Paul. So when you read Ephesians, constantly when you read a text and the text talk about grace, you have to remember that Paul, a pure beatdowns, you know, great all the grace of God did not stop him from getting stoned, flagged, shipwreck, hunger, privation, hard work. What a tough life Paul lived after he found grace. Paul's life after he found grace was brutal. So then that takes us and says, wait a minute, so what is he talking about? See, and that to me is part of what unravels some of this for me. So when you hear a preacher, you go, you can go to, you can put this to the test. This is all powerful, this is, because somebody say, well, you know, I was expecting you to give me something more powerful. Let me tell you, I could tell you a whole bunch of stuff that's powerful. This one here, I don't know, it's have to be in the top three, <laughs> especially for our modern day, we're talking about present truth. You can take this to the test anytime. I've tested this over and over again. You could just turn it on. You go onto YouTube, type in any sermon that happened this year, and find any message about grace. Any of these kind of pastors that are prosperity to pastors, any of them, the top ones, just give me the top five. You can test this on Creflo Dollar, T.D. Drake's, uh, Bill Hybel. I don't think he's still preaching. I think he got caught up with some sex scandal. He had some of his workers, the female leaders, he abused over there. But um, uh, Rick Warren, you take take any of the top pastors, just the uh, top pastors in the United States from mega churches, take their prosperity gospel, watch it, and just sit there as they go through the writings of Paul. Just sit there and think the way they talk about grace and think about Paul's life. And think about how Paul was in prison was at the work preached the gospel full time 
who are working full time have to be stoned and run out of town and all kind of stuff. And then think about Paul talking about grace, you are saved, grace, you are saved, grace, you are saved. And then ask yourself, okay, what is grace? Because Paul's life of grace was rough. Paul's life of grace was rough. And Paul was left with suffering. Paul, you know, think about you, think about the pastor that's healing people. I talk about the power of the gospel to heal and God's healing hand. That Paul never got healed. Paul lived the rest of his life and he begged God. He asked God, he said three times to take away the suffering from him. And the Lord says, no, my grace is sufficient. So what is grace? Because in Paul's experience, true experience of grace, grace is basically while I'm going through my tough time and my tribulation, God is there to help me through. That's what grace is in Paul's. It's a totally different thing. I, I, I don't know if I've ever heard one of these New theology pastor in the Seventh Adventist Church, or one of these prosperity gospel in the first day churches, preach grace like that. Grace is basically you go through suffering, and God just ease it for you, make it easier. Somebody said, "Lord God will take away all the pain away. He'll take the pain away." That's a famous song. You can go on YouTube and type the song up. He'll take the pain away. I don't know if that's the name of the song, uh, but that's a line in the song I always remember. Powerful statement. And yet, you know, the Bible says, you know, you can cry all night, but joy comes in the morning. But yet, we live in a world of sin. And so, it doesn't work like that. So that's why it's best to say to the righteous, just do the right thing. Don't go to a certain path. If you go on a certain path, there's going to be some results. You don't want to add to your trouble. We live in a life of sin and torment and misery. This is a part of the lot of humanity. There are good days, but there's bad days. The more wrong you do, is the more trouble you get on yourself. You go to a certain path and for the rest of your life, you'll be dogged by it. You'll be affected by the rest of your life. Think about it. Though, even towards the end of Paul's ministry, he kept on repeating and reminding everybody, how good God is and how gracious God is because he was a murderer of Christians. It's something that stayed with him for the rest of his life while he lived. So it's better not to go to a certain path because when you go to a certain path, there's some results that are going to follow. And those results could follow you all the way to the grave, even when you start doing ministry. But somebody might say, oh no, but God's grace, it's, it's better to accept God's grace in the beginning and just decide to stay on the straight and narrow. You live life with less regrets, less beat down. So somebody said, what if I've done a lot of mess in my life in the past? Well, now it's time to stop the mess and start moving in a positive direction so you, 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 you get less trouble going forward. And you say, God, forgive me and bless me. And, you know, Lord, there's going to be some results. Because a person get baptized in the church doesn't mean that they're not going to have to try, still pay child support. It doesn't mean that they're still not going to have to deal with a, a, a spouse that is a headache. That they divorce because a person get um, baptized in the church we don't teach them that because of grace they don't have to report to the probation officer if they were once in prison none of that changes it doesn't mean because we accept Jesus Christ we don't have to pay for our debts that we owe either to society or to a lender because we accept Jesus Christ our personal Savior doesn't mean that grace does not mean that we don't avoid certain results of our actions that's just part of the experience. But what the grace does, it takes away some of the pain. It makes it easier. It makes us have to be able to feel like we can move forward, even though we're dealing with some of the mess in the past. We can move forward in a better day. It means that we have hope for salvation. It changes our outlook in life. It means that whoever stole, steal no more. doesn't mean now that some of the people we steal from, they're not looking for us. It doesn't change that. You know, if you lie and put somebody in prison, you have accept Jesus Christ as your personal savior. It just means going forward, you won't lie to put anybody else in prison because you have accepted grace. But it doesn't mean that the person that you put in prison, when they come out, they might not come looking for you. It doesn't mean that if they come looking for you, they'll find you. They might not put two bullets in you and you might not die. It just means at least if you die, you die and go to heaven. See, there's still going to be some results. You just hope that sometime 
you know, while the person in prison, they find Jesus too and they forgive you. <laughs> and you say, okay, I got grace. That's what grace is. But somehow they've taught something totally different. And what happened, people are getting shocked. Now look at this note. He says, I'm going to read it again, verse 11. Woe unto the wicked, it shall be ill with him, for the reward of his hand shall be given him. I've seen people, I've known people personally who told me they went to prison and found the Lord. And not only did they get released earlier, but they had a peaceful experience. Still in prison, still having a rough time, but it wasn't as rough. They were able to more relaxed in a sense of they just accept their punishment and they're not upset and mad anymore. And they start thinking about a new way to live and they move in a different direction. No, it doesn't mean that they weren't in prison. It just means they experienced grace in prison. And what grace did for them is it wasn't so much change. They weren't so much worry, at least for some of them, not all, I guess, but some of the ones I've talked to. They weren't so much worried about the, um, the, the results. What they were is that they were glad for the change of their heart, that grace came inside. You see, what it is, it is the world doesn't change because I receive grace. What changes? I change. See, things might continue the way they are, you know. Grace might find me in a mess. And it's going to take me five years to unravel that mess. But what it does, the grace change my heart. So while I'm going through the unraveling of the mess, my attitude change. See, remember, it's the spirit that God wants to change. Our attitude is most of the time because the sins think. And our minds are messed up with false teachings. So when grace comes, situation could keep going the way it is. But... Our attitude change. The Spirit of God come upon us, calm us down. Because more workable, because more, you know, we can be deal, people can deal with us. And then we can start getting some benefit of righteousness. Think about the thief on the cross. He wasn't there cursing and all that. He was submitted to the fact that he did wrong. See, that's grace. See, he received grace on the cross because he could hear it in his mouth. Before he opened about the Lord when it worked on his mind. And so the situation didn't change because he accepted Christ. What changed was he changed. He says, Lord, forgive me. We did what? We, we, we deserve this. See, and that's what could happen often when a person finds the Lord. Whatever situation they're in, they realize, you know, I've made some choices and I'm result, getting the result of my choice. And that in itself is salvational. Now notice here... As for my people, children are the oppressors, and women rule over them. My people, O oh my people, they which lead thee cause thee to err, and to destroy the ways of thy paths. So you can see the problem. That, you know, if you have children leading you, you're gonna be a mess. So the way to so, so say say for instance somebody is a nice person, but they have a child leading them. The the house is led by a child. No matter how nice you are, it's going to be a mess. So how? what is grace? Grace now is when God comes into your heart, you realize that's a mistake. Women rule over them. You know, that's a mistake. So I'm talking to you here, and you're a guy. And when your wife said jump, you say how high. Grace comes into your heart. and You'll be like, God, it's not that off. Uh, you know, we're both adults here. We can talk stuff over. Stop doing that to me. See, that's great. Now, in the past, you had jump how high. And things are, that's normal. So now, you're going to find, you're going to say, hey, honey, knock that off. I should knock you upside your head. And you're going to be like, uh-oh. Oh. And, you, you know, you're going to have some training and some read thinking to do. And, you know, it's going to be difficult because she used to that leverage over you. And you don't, you don't know how to act and take charge. You don't know how to make decisions. Because that was not in your responsibility. So you just, you going to have to do some training. But grace comes and grace don't come the way we normally think. Some results are going to happen. Because we have gone on the wrong path. And now to change that, it's going to be a problem. Notice here, it's not going to come overnight. And that's where the false teachings, it doesn't work. So as for my people, children rule over them. Verse 13 says, the Lord standeth up to plea and standeth to judge the people. The Lord will enter into judgment with the ancients of his people and the princes thereof. For ye have eaten up the vineyard, the spoil of the poor, 
is in your house? What mean ye that ye beat my people to pieces and grind the face of the poor, says the Lord of hosts? So there's going to be some results. There's going to be some results. You're going to beat down the poor. You're going to have a philosophy that you take the tax, so you cut all the tax for the rich, and you take care of them, and you give less money back, or you take more money from the poor. There's going to be some results. Now, these results are going to come because of what's happening in the society, and also because God. God don't like this. So there's going to be some results. So, but what if a pastor say, oh, but you must prosper? Because prospering is the thing. We equate blessings and righteousness so the more money you have is the more righteous you are. But what if God says you're righteous because you're doing the right thing? And part of doing the right thing is taking the poor. But your preacher said, no, don't worry about that. There's going to be some repercussions that's going to happen in our society. So let's imagine. Um, notice here, you can imagine if, if the Lord says in the Bible that I'm going to bless you and you're going to increase. But he connects that blessing with work. And imagine somebody come and say, I'm going to declare blessing upon you. I'm going to declare prosperity upon you. But you're not working. And you can't understand why that you're not prospering. Imagine so many people living in, 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 in the more, most poor condition. But they're not working. And they can't understand why they're not prospering. And they're looking for a blessing. And they don't understand. The blessing comes with work the blessing comes with righteousness with following the right way but people can't understand that and so because why because often theologians are preaching grace and their method of preaching grace is not to do with god's comfort and all that but it's to do with that says you don't really have to you can receive a blessing you don't have to do the right thing that's that's the predicated upon that and so it's just the reality of life is that the blessings are connected with work. Think about it. Even giving pain a tide. Pain a tide is connected with work. And the Lord says, I'll increase your field. Whether it be your field of labor or the field that you're farming on. Well, that tells me that tide is connected with making money. If you're broke, of course, you're going to complain. You don't want to pay no tide because you're broke. If you're in a business and prospering in the business and making more money in the business... Um, it's not important to you because you don't, you know, you don't have a business, so to speak. Then, you know, tide is not important. You're not trying to prosper. You don't want your field to increase. It, you know, it's tied, but also increasing and being blessed is tied to doing the right thing. <laughs> so, you got to do the right thing in order to get the right results. But imagine if a preacher come along and say you don't have to. Imagine if you're told that you're gonna because you have grace, you're gonna be blessed. But it's like exercise. No matter how much prayer I pray for you, for healing, if the result of your sickness is because you refuse to get up and walk and exercise your body or to work and sweat, you're never going to get the rest blessings of exercise. And you think about the areas in the country that have the highest rates of obesity and morbidly obese people are the areas of the country that has the prosperity gospel. It is so interesting. The poorest areas and the areas that have the most um, spread, worst spread between the rich and the poor are the section of the country that has the largest um, preachers, the most mega churches, and you know, they're normally called the Bible Belt. It's the most basically oppressed area in the country. Area with the lowest amount of people with health insurance can't afford it. They're broke. The areas that have the most trailer parks. And nothing wrong if that's where you're living, but I'm just saying, I'm just saying, say to the righteous, it shall be well with him, but to the wicked, it shall not be well. And you got to think about life like that. That is ironic that the areas where the evangelical churches have their control and their base, it's the area that has the most ignorance, the most poverty, the biggest spread between the rich and the poor. You have the most obese people. You have the people with the least amount of, um, we call it, health insurance. You have high rates of suicide, high rates of shooting. Because remember, even places like southern Chicago, Detroit, 
camp that you work. A lot of these first day churches that are black, they have their power base. You think about places like Chicago, where the Nation of Islam, led by Louis Farrakhan, has its base. It's one of the most violent, murderous places in the country. So you say, what is the benefit of their preaching? More murder. It's just corruption to the hilt. But those are the places that, you know, because people always say, oh, no, it's the urban areas. No, you think about that. It's not really the urban areas. Because the rate of murder for, for homicide is less than suicide. And you have these areas. Think about the places that have the most mass murders, where people go into schools and into theaters or into whatever. Yes, yeah, spread across the country. But in the Bible Belt, they don't stop blowing each other away. Because they have the gospel and they have grace. What grace tells you, God's going to bless you in spite of your action. But the Bible says, no, tell the righteous you shall be well with him. But tell the unrighteous that says he shall eat the fruit of his doing. So when you see the fruit of the, the doings, you can see the fruit of the doings is not good. But somebody say, oh no, no, those things have nothing to do with anything. And that's, that, why, the only reason why a person would say that is because their preacher is telling them. That their action doesn't matter because God's grace. God's going to bless you with favor. Think about it, that's how they, they preach. All in, that God's going to bless you with favor. But I'm telling you, when you follow the way of the Lord, the Lord will bless you with favor. Don't listen to them telling you that it's just some supernatural blessing and God does not take into account your action. Because remember, if you are a bad steward, God is not going to give you more than you already have that you're wasting. Because you're just going to squander it. If you're not taking care of the blessings that you have right now, why should you get more? So God want to bless you, but you need to show forth that what God already blessed you with, you're going to take care of. How many people you know, they have money and just wasted it, and the more is like a curse. It doesn't do anything good for them because it just exposed them that the more is just a terrible thing. Notice in First Corinthians, Second Corinthians chapter six, verse one through ten. Second Corinthians chapter six, verse one through ten. Notice here. Notice I mentioned Paul, because you see, in Paul's writing, he clearly states that grace is not what they're preaching. When you have grace, the Lord's gonna make better whatever bad situation you're in. It might not remove everything, but it's gonna make you know what happened. This is bad, but it's way better than what it was. Notice here in first second Corinthians six verse one through ten. Notice it says, When we then, as workers together with him, beseech you also that you receive not the grace of God in vain. So here Paul is saying that you could receive the grace of God in vain. That means that God gives you kindness, He gives you mercy, He gives you love, He gives you He comes next to you and He treats you with some respect and tenderness and you know, that's what grace is. Grace is like when somebody put on a, a glove and they hold you tenderly and God says, Okay, You've beaten up yourself, but I'm going to give you something called the health message. You've beaten up yourself, but I'm going to give you something called the Ten Commandment. These are your boundaries. Don't let people abuse you, okay? And you say, uh, no, I don't want all that. I don't want none of that. I just want grace. And you're like, so what is grace? God just gave you grace. So notice here he says, For he said, I have heard the in an acceptable time, and in the day of salvation I have succored thee. Behold, now is the accept accepted time. Behold, now is the day of salvation. Given no offense in anything, that the ministry be not blamed. But in all things approving ourselves as the ministers of God, in much patience, in affliction, in necessity, in distress. So notice here, Grace is accepted, not in vain. And Paul's experience of grace is that he has to exercise patience. He has to go through affliction, through necessities. So why? Because when you, you have grace and you have need, God gives you the grace to go through that and not to go berserk. And then you look back and you say, before grace came, I would have gone crazy going through this experience. But now you go through an experience and you have need and you be like calm. And somebody say, how can you be calm going through that? And you say, because of God's grace. It's in me. You see, grace is something that works on your heart. But people make grace have to do with a gift. See, the gift is the grace inside of me. So the world doesn't change because I've changed. But I've changed. 
so the world is changed to me in the sense of how I see the world. Don't say in distress. Doesn't mean because I have grace, I'm never going to go through distress. But I'm going to tell you something. Sometimes, you know, the Bible says the Lord make a way of escape. When you panic, you don't see the way, way of escape. So God give you grace to calm you down. So you might say, oh yeah, that's the way of escape. You know, they say haste make ways. I've always, I sometimes I'm like, you know, something happened to me and I waste something and I waste it and I like, God, I know better. I know it's not the action that I need to worry about. The discipline, the spiritual discipline is you learn to calm yourself. Now, you don't just say, God, give me grace. Or you say, I accept your grace, God. And things are going awire. And you say, God, I know this is a test. I'm supposed to go through this with grace. And when you calm yourself down, it just opens up and things work out. You, you panic, you rush, and by you make things worse. And you be like, man, I'm not learning. I need to, t I need to always make sure the grace of God is working out my heart. You ever be in a situation where you're about to say something, and you're about to give it to somebody, and you accept the grace of God, and you calm yourself down, and you humble yourself, you hold back, and then something work out, and something get taken care of. The person says, hey, like I put you on hold. They come back and say, oh, you know, we, we sorted out. We see what the problem was. And you'll be like, man, I'm glad I didn't say nothing. I'm glad the grace of God. See, that's the grace of the Bible. The grace of the Bible is more. It's different from what is taught in these places. That's why the people are so messed up. Because see, grace is, when you go before your, your food to eat, you say, God, give me grace that I only eat half this plate because I have food for two people here, God. So that's grace. So you say grace over the food. <laughs> and we say grace over the food. God said, God, don't let me act like a pig in front of this meal. So in stripes, notice, imprisonment. So Paul said, I'm locked up in prison, but I'm calm. In tumult, in labor, in watching, in fasting, by pureness, by knowledge, by long suffering, by kindness, by the Holy Ghost, by love unfeigned, by the word of truth, by the power of God. By the armor of righteousness in the right hand and on the left hand, by honor or and dishonor. So say, man, people treat me good, I have grace. People treat me like I'm not nobody, I treat me with dishonor, still have grace. See, it's me, it's inside of me what the grace does. See, grace, you know, the pigs are going to still be pigs, but I have grace, so I don't eat the pigs. By evil report and good report, by deceivers, yet true. So he said, look, they deceive me and I'm like trying to trick me. I must still be true to them. I must still act true. Don't he say as, as unknown and yet well known, as dying and behold, we live as chastened and not killed. So whatever is going on with we, notice he said, no matter what's happening, we still we. And that's one of the hardest things, but that's one of the things I've learned. I'm Christian in all situations. So somebody said, why well, somebody lie on you? That's them. Me over here, I'm still have to be Christian. That's my test. Because bad things are going to happen, but how do I react to it? That's the grace of God on me. Grace of God might not be on them. Notice, so as sorrowful, yet always rejoicing. As poor, yet making many rich. As having nothing, and yet possessing all things. You know it's grace of God. When you, you're, looking at, you're looking at a situation, you're like, I'm going to preach this, and I know this is going to bless somebody. Uh, and yeah, I don't I don't have no I don't have the money. You, you think about the, the the work of the Levi, right? Now the Levi work was the Lord said to him that says your blessing is to bless Israel. That's your inheritance. And so you're gonna get certain benefits. Uh, but you're not gonna get the physical benefit, the temporal benefit. Paul later carries this thought in the New Testament. Says this is your benefit for your labor. But over here, you so he says, look, Paul here picks it up. He says, yet yeah, making many rich, but yet I'm poor. But God's grace is doing that. Because what? you could be like, man, I need to make myself rich also. I'm going to benefit all these people. And I'm not being benefited. Paul said, look, that's grace on him. And that's grace on a preacher. But you see, the preachers nowadays, they want to get some of the cut. So they preach all kind of madness. So notice here in um, Isaiah chapter 33, verse 14, through 17 it says the sinners in zion are afraid and fearfulness had surprised the hypocrites who among us shall dwell with with the devouring fire who among us shall dwell with everlasting burning 
He that walketh righteously and speaketh uprightly, he that despiseth the gain of oppression, that shaketh his hand from holding of bribes, that stoppeth his ear from hearing of blood, and shutteth his eye from seeing evil, he shall dwell on high. His place of defense shall be the munitions of rocks. Bread shall be given him, his water shall be sure. Thine eye shall see the king in his beauty. They shall behold the land that is very far off. So the question is asked, whether it be in life here or life for eternity, who shall dwell with everlasting burning? It is or with the devouring fire. It is the righteous. So that's why he says, and uh, to me, the Lord is saying to me, Lord, Lord, say to the righteous, it shall be well with him. Whether it be evil when trouble hits down here or for eternity, who shall it be well with? With the righteous. Somebody said, but doesn't grace of God mean that? Grace does mean because you've received grace from the Lord and forgiveness. And the Lord's going to save you. The Lord's going to bless you. And the way the Lord bless you, number one, he bless you. Now, your circumstances might be a mess, but the Lord's going to bless you. Remember, Paul says in Ephesians that he sit in heavenly places while he was in prison. No, the prison situation wasn't good, but Paul, grace was upon him. That's what grace is. So the Bible says, say to the righteous, she shall, shall be well. But somebody says, but he's in prison. How shall that be well? Well, you know, as I say, the grace of God come upon us. And so Paul said, well, sometimes we're blessed. Sometimes we're in a trouble. Sometimes we're in a good situation. Sometimes we're in a pickle. But God's grace is always upon me. And as long as God's grace is upon me, then it shall be well with me. In Zach Zachariah, Zechariah chapter 7, verse 9 and 10 says, Thus speak, speak at the Lord of hosts, saying, Execute true judgment and show mercy and compassion every man to his brother, and oppress not the widow, nor the fatherless, the stranger, nor the poor, and let none of you imagine evil against his brother in his heart. That's just the reality. You can't do nothing about that. All you can do is say, God, give me grace to not do this to the poor. And the moment you say that, God says, tell this man that just said that and pray that prayer. It shall be well with him. So I'm telling you, it shall be well with you. You're not oppressing anybody. You're not hurting the poor. You're not causing wars and destruction upon people. God says, it shall be well. But somebody said, well, Lord, what if there's a disaster? Tell the man it's going to be well with him. It's going to be all right with you. Just like he says before, say when trouble comes, it will be well with you. If you should even pass away, which you're all going to pass away if Christ will come soon, tell the man it's going to be well with him. I'm going to take care of him. But with the unrighteous, tell him it's not going to be well with him. Tell him that he's going to receive the, the reward of his doing. Tell him hellfire is prepared for him because he's not doing right. And no gospel, no prosper. Because that's, that's why I've looked at this. Because somebody said, why do you look at these things so much? I look at it because I want to see if it plays out practical. Because does do we go in the Bible better and see people being told that they, they could do all the wars they want. They could hate on people. They could be racist. They could be, you know, love to give money to the rich people and, and, and hurt the poor. Is it well with him? And I look at it and I say, I can't see no evidence that it's well with him. So I flip over there and I say, let's go to the evolutionists. Is it well with the evolutionists? I'm like, no, they're popping themselves up with bullets in their heads. They're committing suicide and they're depressed and they are not kind of drugs. So the Bible says, Lord, please tell the man that is righteous that it shall be well with him. But with the wicked, it shall not be well with him. And that's what the Bible is saying. That no matter what they say, no matter we come with all kind of spurious false doctrine to try to twist the Bible, Paul says, look, it well with me in whatever situation, if I'm a base or I'm a bound, it's well with me. Why? Because it's in me. The gospel does not come with observation because salvation come in my heart. It's inside of me. And so whatever situation, if I have a lot of money, it's well with me. If I'm broke, it's well with me. But when a person come and preach a doctrine, I use the Bible and say the only way you know it's well with you if you have money. And to make material possession become the only mark of righteousness or the only mark of a blessing. That's not good. Because Paul said, look, I was in bad situation and good situation. And it was always good. Noah was in the ark, out the ark. It was good with him. The righteous, whatever situation, David, when he was in the palace or he was in the mountains running from Saul, it was still good with him. Tell the righteous man that God will be with him and give him grace in whatever situation he's in, good or bad. 
because he will eat the fruit of his doing. It's going to always be good with him. But when, it is, when it's all said and done, Christ will come and save him in the kingdom. So I say to you, it is well with you if you are the righteous. Let us pray. Our Father, who art in heaven, I thank you for the blessings of your word, the blessings of this day. I pray they may be with us as we go the rest of this day, dear Lord, that your grace may be upon us. And truly, dear Lord, that our hearts may be changed, that we might love your words, love your doings, and that we might be righteous and it might be well with us. Bless us, we pray for Christ's sake. Amen. Thanks for being with me here on Revive Reform Radio. Looking forward to talking to you again tomorrow morning where we should talk about the importance of church. Until then, I pray that you may continue walk with the King. Thank you.